It's great to see you for worship today. Let's stand up together. And let's begin to praise the Lord with all of our hearts. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of creation. He is the first, the last, the one who matters most. Yes, he is.
Thank you, Lord, for your presence here. We lift you up, Lord. We want to see you today. Move in our midst, we pray, Lord.
Are you glad to be in the Lord's house today? You know, we can put our eyes on lots of stuff, church. But today, just for this time, my prayer is that all of us would just get laser focused. Laser focused. You know what that means? How many of you know what laser focus? If you have ADD like me, you know what laser focus is, right? But we could just get laser focused in on Jesus and on the work that he wants to do in our midst and in our lives. Amen. Would you like to see that today? Amen. Amen. Come on, let's praise the Lord. Amen. Yeah. Hey, we want to be sure that everybody feels welcome in the house today. If you're visiting with us, we're so glad you're here. Uh, take that yellow card in the back of the pew, fill it out, and then later on when the offering plate comes by, just drop it in there. We'd love to be able to follow up with you this week and reach out. Uh, we'd love to be able to do that with you. Everybody else, uh, hey, turn around. Greet those folks around you. Let's make sure everyone feels welcome this morning. Welcome. Thanks again. this great hymn together, would you? Let's join in, everyone.
everyone sing it out together today. My hope is built on nothing.
Amen. Amen. We praise the Lord today. Hey, our ushers are coming forward right now. And I want to ask you a question today. A question that I asked myself uh, just, a, just a few short weeks ago. And uh, you can remain standing if you, yeah, thanks. We're, we're going to sit down in just a second. I want to ask you this question. What are you doing in your life that requires faith? You know, we're trained all of our life. You know, get everything set up just right, okay? Get, get all your, the, the, the parts of your life in their, in their place. You know, get everything organized, and that's beautiful. That's wonderful. But what are you doing in your life that requires faith? Giving is a huge and a perfect example of that. You know, because a lot of times we look at the numbers and they don't make sense, and, and we say, I can't, I can't afford to give. You know, times are hard. But that requires no faith, does it? What are you doing in your life that requires faith? As a believer and as a follower of Christ, you should have an answer. There should be something. Amen? And let's pray. Thank you, Jesus, for the opportunity to be here in worship today and to stretch ourselves for you and to honor you and to glorify you. Lord, as these offering plates come by each of us today, let that question resonate with us. What are we doing that requires faith? Bless this offering, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.
If you brought a Bible with you, uh, find Romans chapter 13. August of um, 1980. I look back at my life, there's some major milestones. And uh, log August uh, of 1980, there was a, a point of crisis. I want to say a crisis of faith, but there was a point of crisis because uh, I surrendered my life to Christ when I was 16, and uh, God radically changed me. He redirectioned me. He uh, put me on a narrow path. He straightened me out. And uh, between then and the time I was 20, um, I had graduated from high school. I had started going to college. And... Uh, God was opening doors of opportunity for me to do stuff in different places. But to be honest with you, it's more of a hobby than anything else. But underneath the surface, there was, a, there was a gnawing. There was a restlessness. There was an unsettledness. And uh, I, I understood exactly what it was, but I'd convinced myself that I could do some other things. And so I had decided that I was going to go to college and that I was going to get a degree in history and that I would get a master's and I'd get a PhD in history and that I was going to teach history. I always have loved history. And I'd convinced myself that I was just going to be the best history professor that there was. So I started down that road. I, I started college, first year, second year. At the end of my second year of college, there was a crisis point. Because I understood and knew that in August of 1980, that the direction that I chose to go would really say a whole lot about my life and about my focus and everything. And so after a long struggle, I came to grips with the call of God upon my life. That God had placed a call on me. And I really couldn't get away from that call. I could do a lot of things, I could have been a lot of places and uh, met a lot of people, but that call was there, and I knew it was there. You know, a lot of times as Christians, we don't think about ourselves as called. Uh, we talk about the pastor has a calling on his life, the staff has a calling on their life, missionaries have a calling on their life. But really, if you take your Bible and you dig into it, you'll discover that really every follower of Christ has a calling on their life. Paul told the church at Corinth, he said, but not many are called. There's a call that God has placed upon us. But the sad irony of it is this. In the modern church today, more people are content with being keepers of the aquarium than they are to be fishers of men. Uh, we're more content to be hearers of the gospel than those that will actually herald the gospel. And when you look at our world today, there's so much chaos and confusion and, and there's so much darkness out there but they're not unlike times past when God has always risen up and he's spoken in voices of authority and ultimatum, and he always does it through his people. Joshua stepped up and he said this, Choose you this day who you'll serve. And believe it or not, that's a, that's a nagging question that still is being asked today. I mean, who are we really serving? Who are we really focusing on? Who are we really ministering for? Choose you this day. And then Elijah really got it down to where the issue was laid out for all to see when he said, if the world is God, go serve it. But if the Lord is God, serve him. Then Isaiah, you could read, and he would run through the streets and he would preach messages and he would basically say this, awake, awake, shake yourself because 
the church is almost like a slumbering giant. It's like a Rip Van Winkle, and we're going to wake up one day, and the war is going to be over. And that's really a condition of the American church today. I mean, we go through the motions and uh, we plan the services and we sing the songs and we preach the sermons and we have the Bible studies and we plan the special events and they come and they go, but yet it's almost as if we're walking in our sleep. That we don't see things clearly for what they really are. Have you come to grips with the call of God upon you? Do you think our church has, has a sense of calling? Do you have a sense of calling? When we think about the call of God upon our lives, there's, there's several things that, that come to mind. Romans chapter 13, Paul says this, and that knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of our sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. He says, the night is far gone. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness. And let us walk honestly, properly as in the light. Not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantingness, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Anytime you see the word time in the Bible, it means one of two things. It either means a length of time, a duration of time, or it means an urgent, critical time. And Paul is saying to the church at Rome, he says, and that knowing the urgent, critical time in which you're living. It's an urgent time. It's a critical time. It's an important time. And Paul basically says, if you're going to live in days like these, in these urgent, critical, important times, it's imperative that you come to grips with a calling that God has placed upon you. Do you have a sense of call upon your life? And so it, it's important that we wake from our sleep to, to the time that we live in. It's a critical time that we live in. It's an important time that we live in. It's an urgent time that we're living in. It's important in the history of the world. It's important in the history of, of, of the church universal. It's important in the history of this church in and of itself. This is a critical, urgent, important time. And so it's time for us to awake. You know, this journey with Gina has been pretty amazing. If you have Facebook and you're my friend, you saw a video this week and one thing you understand, preachers can't dance, okay? <laughs> but it's also amazing what you'll do for your girl, okay? But as she becomes more awake, aware, it is amazing to see what's happening. This month will be five months into this journey. And she and I this week were sitting down and we were talking and we were looking and, and she was saying, I'm not getting better. I'm not going back to therapy. I'm not getting any better. I can't go back. And I said, oh, you're getting better. You're getting better. No, I'm not getting better. I'm not getting better. And I said, well, sit down here. You and I, I want to show you some things. And through this whole journey, I've taken pictures and videos and different things. And I said, now I'm going to show you some things that you've not seen before. And I said, I'm going to tell you some of them are not pretty. And so we sat there on the couch in the apartment in Atlanta and I got my phone and I went back and I, and I pulled up the picture 
of the day they told me that she wouldn't live through the day. On a respirator, face is swollen, not pretty. I said, that's you. And then I scrolled through and I pulled up a few more pictures during that time. And I said, you couldn't talk. There was a time you weren't moving your right side. I said, do you know it was a major victory when you moved your foot? And then we went a f further and I said, this is your first day at the Shepherd Center. And I said, look, I said, they've got you in a harness. I said, you couldn't even, you couldn't stand up. You couldn't get up. You couldn't walk. And they had to lift you out of the bed and they had to put you in the chair. And then they had to pick you up out of the chair and, and lift you back into the bed. I said, you were dependent on everything. You couldn't eat. You couldn't swallow. You couldn't open your eyes. We went a little bit further. I said, this is your first day at therapy. They were just trying to get you to, to sit down that day. And you sat down, but then you stood up. And I said, here you are right there. I said, look at you. I said, it's like you're not even awake, but you're do going through the motions. And then we went a little bit further down through there, and I got pictures of her, you know, walking with assistance and pictures of her doing different things and videos of her doing different things. And I said, and now look at you now. She's becoming more awake. In a lot of ways, the church is like that today. It's like we go through the motions, and, but yet we're in a spiritual slumber. We're in a spiritual stupor. And, and, and yeah, we, we do things because we've been programmed to do things, but we're not really cognizant. We're not really aware. There's not an awareness to us. And Paul says, and that knowing the time is now an important, critical, urgent time that we wake up. But he also says this, it's time for us to walk. He says, walk, he said, walk honestly as in the day. What does your walk with God look like? Is there a walk with God at all? Walking means relating. Walking means communicating with Him. How is your communication with God? How is your prayer life? Many years ago, there was a preacher by the name of Duncan Campbell who was preaching a a conference in London and he said in the middle of the night he said God woke me up in the middle of the night he said I sat straight up out of the bed he said I was wide awake and he said the Spirit of God spoke to me and said you need to go to the Hebrides the Hebrides is a chain of islands off the coast of Scotland there and and so Duncan Campbell said it was so real it was so vivid he said I literally got out of the bed packed my bags and he said I was on the dock the next morning when the sun rose and he said, I bought a ticket on the first ship to the Hebrides. He said, I had no idea where I was going, what I was going to do. He said, all I knew is there was a call of God upon my life to go. And he said, I got up and I went. And he said, when the ship docked, he said, I got off. And he said, I began to look around. And he said, I didn't know of anything else to do. And so I stopped the guy on the street and said, excuse me, can you tell me where the pastor of the local church lives? He said, well, sir, we don't have a preacher. We've got an elder and his wife, and I can tell you how to get to their house. And so Duncan Campbell got the directions, and he grabbed his bags, and he found himself on the doorstep of this house in front of people he'd never met before. He knocked on the door, and when the lady opened the door, she looked at him, and she saw him, and she said, Dr. Campbell, we've been expecting you. Campbell said that she saw the surprise on my, my face, and so she invited me in. She said, my husband's not here right now, but let me tell you what's been going on. Our church doesn't have a pastor, and she said, to be honest with you, our church needs revival. Our church needs a wind, a fresh wind to move across our congregation, and our city needs, our community needs revival. And my husband and I have prayed and we fasted, and God impressed upon us that you are the one to come 
at such a time as this. And so by faith, we said to God, if you'll have him here, we'll be ready. He said, so he went to church that night and he said he spoke and he said, uh, not a lot of response, a little response. And after the service was over, the, the elder said, Dr. Campbell, he said, I tell you what, let's, you and I, get in a room and pray. And so they got together and they began to pray and they began to call out to God and they began to ask God to move. And at one o'clock in the morning, history says that the elders said, Dr. Campbell, you can stop praying because the Spirit of God is moving on the island. And if you read the account of the Hebrides revival, they say that the doors of houses came open in the middle of the night and that grown men literally ran out into the street, fell down on their knees and cried out to God in repentance. And by the time the sun rose the next morning, over 60% of the island had been transformed by one mighty sweep of the hand of God. When's the last time you prayed like that? When's the last time you came to God and said, God, we've done everything we know to do? We preached every sermon we know to preach. We've taught every lesson we, we, we know to, to teach. We've, we've planned every event that we know. We've tried every gimmick, every gadget, everything that, that there is. And God, we don't know what else to do. And so, oh God, would you please come down and help us? You see, when you walk with Jesus and you have a sense of call upon your life, you understand some things. You understand that there are some things that you can do, but there's only, there are other things that only God can do. And the problem with the American church today is we are so consumed by walking in the power of the flesh that we neglect to walk in the power of the Spirit. And so when I'm walking with God, there is communication with God. But also when, when I'm walking with God, I'm communicating with others. Honestly. When's the last time you had a conversation with somebody about Jesus? Have you ever had a conversation with anybody about Jesus? If you never talked to anybody about Jesus, one of two things are the, at the root. Number one, you've never been saved in the first place. Or number two, you're so immature and so guided by the flesh that it never comes across the screen of your mind. Fifteen, sixteen years ago in Alabama, there was a community that was planning a revival. The pastor of that church had, had challenged his people, ask God to show you one person that needs Jesus. And you begin to pray for them and ask God what you need to do. And so for weeks leading up to this, there was a prayer emphasis. There was uh, challenges to to pray, to ask God, to show them. Well, there were four men in this church who all became burdened for this one guy in their town. He owned a garage. He was a mechanic. Nice guy. Do anything in the world for anybody. Giving person, but they knew something. Lost. And so these four guys began to pray for him by name. They began to ask God, you know what, Lord, what would you have us to do? He needs Jesus. And so they all came together and they decided, we're going to bring him to the revival one night. They settled on Tuesday night. His shop stayed open late during the weeks. He's the hardest working man that they knew. And so these four guys showed up at his garage Tuesday afternoon. And they said to him, and said, John, we have a revival at our church. 
and wants you to come with us. He said, man, I can't come to church. He said, look at me. I'm not dressed for church. They said, we knew you were going to say that. Look at us. We got on the same thing you got on. You need to come. He said, well, I mean, look around. I got all this business. I mean, I've got to change the oil in this car and change the oil in that car, and the tires have to be rotated over here, and I'm finishing this up and finishing it up. He said, you know, we knew you were going to say that too. Don't you remember? One of the guys said, I'm a mechanic, and I own my own place. I'll do the oil changes. I'll rotate the tires. I'll finish that up. You go wash your hands. You're going to church tonight. Till finally they took away all the excuses, and John finally said, okay, I'll go. So they come to church that night. All four of them come walking in. All four of them got on their, their mechanic's clothes. And, and that night, the Spirit of God got a hold of that old boy, and he surrendered his heart and life to Jesus, and he got saved. When's the last time you became so burdened that you were willing to do whatever it took? Occasionally I get fan mail. Tell them that, just answer it and put it on speaker. Tell them it's pretty good today. <laughs> Occasionally, I'll get some fan mail. And I've got notebooks like this thick in my office with the good ones in it. Because, you know, the devil throws enough fiery darts at you every now and then. You just need to sit down and you need to go back through and you need to be reminded. But there's another side of me that wish I'd kept some of the bad ones. Let me tell you about some bad ones I got. Not here. When I was in Jacksonville, we started a new church out toward the beach, and it was a different church. It was different than this church. Median age was 35. We started with like 300 people. In 10 years, we had 1,500. Half of them had come to faith in Christ. God was moving. God was working. There was, there was transformation taking place. I used to eat almost every day at the roadhouse out by Regency Mall. I don't know why I went there every day. I guess I'm a creature of habit. I liked it. And so I'd been going so much that when I walked in the door, they knew who I was. I didn't even have to say anything. I had a table over there that I normally had if nobody was sitting at it. And so by the time I would get to the table, the Diet Coke would be sitting on the table. I knew everybody that worked there. And there was a young man that worked there that I'd been talking to. And, and this guy was an only child. He lost his parents, and he was struggling with some things. Struggled with depression. And so one day I'd gone in there, and I'd sat down, and he came and waited on me, and I said, just bring me my chicken Caesar salad. And so he brought it to me, and we were talking, and I said, listen, Sunday I'm speaking on what the Bible has to say about depression. And I said, I think you ought to come because God has something that he has to say about what you're dealing with that I think can help you. And he said, man, you don't understand. I don't have clothes to wear. And I said, what you have on is fine. He had on a pair of blue jeans and a T-shirt. He goes, no, it's not really church clothes. I said, you don't understand this church. I said, we got people coming in shorts and flip-flops and T-shirts. We got women... You know, coming, they have their bathing suits on underneath their, underneath their T-shirts. I mean, they're, they're going to the beach as soon as church is over. I mean, you'll fit right in. He said, well, I'll think about it. And so anyhow, it came time to pay, and I had my credit card, and I went to hand it to him, and I pulled it back. When he went reached for it, I said, are you coming Sunday? He said, you don't understand. I don't have anything to wear. I said, I need you to come. He said, I'll think about it. I said, okay. So I'd already calculated my next move. So he brings the bill to me, gives my credit card back. And, and so I'm looking at the bill and I said, okay. Before I sign this, I need an answer. Yes or no, are you coming? 
He said, Lee, you don't understand. I mean, I just don't feel comfortable. I don't, I said, I tell you what, what if I match you? What if I match you on Sunday? I'm going to wear jeans and a t-shirt Sunday. I said, now hundreds of people are going to be there. You're going to blend into the crowd out there. I said, but trust me on this one. It will not go unnoticed that I got jeans and t-shirt on. But if it'll make you feel better, I'll wear jeans and t-shirt Sunday if you'll come. He said, okay, I'll be there. I said, service starts at 1030. Sunday morning, I got up, got a shower, walked out of the shower, went to my so closet, opened the door, picked through, grabbed my lucky jeans, <laughs> pulled them on. Gina looked at me and said, what are you doing? I said, I'm getting ready for church. She said, are you wearing that? I said, well, I'm wearing a shirt with it. I'm not going like this. <laughs> and so I pillaged through the drawer and I found a T-shirt that was, let's just say it was presentable. So I put it on. I went to church. When I walked out on the platform to speak, <laughs> I mean, like people were like looking around like, what's going on? I wish I could say I preached that Sunday, and after I preached that Sunday, I gave the invitation. That guy ran down the aisle. He gave his life to Jesus. He surrendered to be a missionary. He's gone to Africa. I wish I could say all that, but you know what? None of that happened. But I also understood this. The Bible says some plant, some water, but God gives the increase. You see, when the call of God is upon your life, you're willing to do whatever it takes to get lost people to Jesus. You say, well, you know, we need a program to reach people. No, you don't. No, you don't. And I'm going to show you. Camera guys are going to go crazy. I'm going to show you. Everybody gets nervous when I start walking around. It's Mike Builder back here. Mike Builder back is the, ch get a close up on him so the people in Monroe County can see him, okay? <laughs> He's a county commissioner, the chairman of the county commissioners, aren't you? Monroe County. God has strategically placed him in that place. You know, the Bible says right now we look through a glass dimly. We don't see it clearly. But one day, we'll see it as clear as day. I think it's going to be interesting that day when we look back on this life and God allows us to see it clearly, we'll see that God had a specific plan and purpose for our life and that he strategically placed us exactly where he wanted us to be. And so here we got a guy that's in government that God has placed. You uncomfortable? Very. Yeah. <laughs> Here's a guy that's in government that God has strategically placed. Think of the influence and the impact that could be had as a result of his life. Or I'm going to let you off. Jay Willingham. Y'all, don't get too close on him. He'll scare the audience to death. You know what Jay does? Jay owns a collection agency. Some of you may have gotten a call from him. I hope not. <laughs> But God, God strategically, you think about it now, you're talking a lot of times with people in hardship, people that are dealing with desperate situations, people that are struggling in this economy and everything that we have. God's placed him right there. That's a mission field for him. It's a mission field. We have doctors that God has placed in position. We have school teachers that God has placed in position. We have a CEO of a, an electrical uh, company that God has placed. Ron's a truck driver. He's all across this nation, and you don't even know about it, but, but he carries the gospel with him everywhere he goes. I know what some of you are doing, like, dear Jesus, don't let him come back here with us. <laughs> I mean, we're looking around. And in this room, I mean, Anna Roberts, I mean, the lady laying on the sign on Rivoli Boulevard, you know who I'm talking about. I mean, the one that lights Facebook up all the time, talking about her closings and everything like that. God places her in, in, the, in, the, in the lives of people moving into our city. What greater person to be a, a spokesperson for Jesus and the kingdom of God and the ministry of this church? God strategically placed her there. 
John Hall's a bank president. God has placed him in the position, strategically placed him there. Peter Allen's an attorney. Al Andrews an engineer. Ron uh, works with IBM, and he's a he's a big shot, y'all. The southeastern United States, his territory. He's all over the he's all over the country. He's around the world. We sit here and we say, you know what, man? We just when you're walking with Jesus. When you're walking with Jesus, you can't help but talk about Jesus. When you love Jesus, you can't help but talk about Jesus. And God's given us the platform. He's given us the platform. He's given us the opportunity. But are we awake to the opportunity that's there? So it's time to wake up. It's time to walk. I got to hurry. There's an awareness. Did you catch what he said? Walk honestly as in the day. Walk in the light is, is in the day. I mean, are we convinced that Jesus is coming again? I'm convinced that the New Testament church believed that he would come at any moment, and that's why they did what they did. That's why they served like they served. That's why they were as passionate as they were. Walk honestly as in the day, as in the light. Not in riding and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantingness, not in strife and envy. That's all darkness stuff. I never did finish the story about the T-shirt and the jeans. Oh, the next week was an interesting week. I got several emails. And then I got some of those unsigned ones. <laughs> Letters. You know what that is? Somebody asked me sometime, well, you got anywhere, any idea where that came from? I said, yeah, I know exactly where it came from. It came straight out of hell. It smelled of smoke when I opened it. <laughs> the earnest tea bass of the spiritual life. I'm going to stand in the dark and let me throw some rocks in there so nobody can see me throwing rocks, but I'm going to throw rocks. God's not in any of that. I never said a word about any of it. About three weeks later, I was preaching. And I said, how many of y'all remember when I wore the T-shirt and the jeans? Everybody, oh, they start laughing. Yeah, we remember. I told them the story. After the service, I had at least a dozen come to me and say, I owe you an apology. I misjudged you. I was wrong. Now, none of the anonymous characters, they don't ever come to you. <laughs> Do you believe Jesus could come? Let me tell you, if you thought Jesus was coming today by 5 o'clock, it's a game changer. First thing I'm, I, you would do, if you knew he was coming at 5 o'clock, shout of an archangel, trumpet blast of God, we're going. You're going to get prayed up. Every sin that you can think of is going to be confessed. Second thing you're going to do is you are going to talk to people that you love about Jesus. God's placed a call on your life. My life, yes. He's placed a call on you too. You know what my job is? My biblical job description, here it is. Pray, study, preach, equip. You for the work of ministry. God doesn't hold me accountable for how much money is given or not given. Thank God for that. He doesn't hold me accountable for how many people get saved and how many don't. 
He doesn't even hold me accountable for church attendance. What he does is hold me accountable. Am I close and clean? And am I equipping? And I would add, a four, I'd add another one to that is I model. I don't ask you to do anything that I don't do. Jen and I tithe and give above the tithe. I talk to people about Jesus. I pray for this church, for the ministry, for the kingdom of God around the world. Listen again to what Paul said. And that knowing the time. If now is not a critical time in the life of this church, I don't know what is. If now is not a critical time in the history of the world, I don't know what is. And knowing the critical, urgent time in which we live. And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of our sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Today. It's at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day. Not in riding and drunkenness, chambering, wantonness, strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Walk in the Spirit. Make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. God, awaken us from who we are and where we've been and where we are to the people you want us to be, to the church you want us to be. In Jesus' name. Your heads bowed and your eyes closed for just a moment. How are you living out your call? Are you fulfilling your calling that God has placed on you? When we do, it's a game changer. And so today I pray that you listen to the voice of God as he speaks to you. We're going to stand and we're going to sing in just a moment. And maybe you've not been living out that call. Maybe you struggled with your call. Or maybe you're living out your calling and you've discovered that that's not always an easy road to take. This altar is up. You can come and pray. Ask God for help, for direction. And he'll show you. Others of us are here today. We're not a member of any church. Kind of floating around. Is God calling you here? If he is today, the day is at hand. John and Bobby are here just come and say, we want to join this church. We have some people that will explain that to you. If you've never given your life to Jesus, never surrendered to him, today is the day. Lord, speak to our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. We stand and we sing. I need thee every hour.